Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's the Fish Tank Guy here, and welcome to the Fish Tank Pod. Oh, boy, welcome to the Fish Tank Guy podcast. I'm already off to a terrible start. Uh, today is Friday, March 16th, 2018. And guys, I apologize. It's been over a month since I have done a podcast. My last podcast was on Valentine's Day there on February 14th. And since then, I've just been busy with a lot of things. I've had a lot going on. I've thrown a surprise birthday party for my wife. I've worked on the fish tank tower a lot. And uh, I've just had a bunch of other things kind of going on with work, outside of work that kind of stuff, so I haven't gotten around to doing the podcast, but I hope to get back to my every other week rhythm, because I've been getting some good feedback from a few folks who listen to the podcast, all five of you, thank you very much, and I've got some cool topics in the next few weeks, so I'm going to tell you what I'll be doing, what I'll be talking about today, I'll be going through with just a random update on life in general, that'll only be a few minutes, I'll be talking about my fish tanks i'll be talking about a little gaming i'll do my five quick movie reviews and then i will move on to the fish tank topic of the week which is cleaning your aquarium glass Um, and i also have my fish of the week and it goes to a fun fish this week that is cool that you guys might want to check out for your aquarium at home so thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast supporting the podcast and uh let's just get into it so it's uh march As you guys more than likely know, it is March Madness, which means the NCAA basketball tournament is in full swing, and people are really excited about it, and personally, I... I don't really care all that much. I'm I'm a big basketball fan, but I'm not a college basketball fan. A lot of people will say that is like blasphemy, that I should love college basketball more than the NBA because they try harder and they're so, so passionate and all this other stuff. Well, you know, the way I see it is that when March Madness rolls around, people care about the tournament as far as their bracket goes. Right, As soon as their bracket is busted, people don't really care anymore. Um, there are some good games, don't get me wrong. I enjoy watching some of the tournament, but I just don't follow it religiously. Because A, I have a hard time keeping up with who's on the teams. And if I don't really know who's on the teams, it's hard for me to become you know, invested in the team. And you know, B, like a lot of the games aren't that good. For every good game there is, it's a nail-biter that comes down to the end. There is another game that is not very good. And, you know, the, the 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 offense is bad, the defense is bad, it looks like a sloppy game. So it's kind of hit or miss for me as far as that goes. So you've got Mar- March Madness going on right now. Arizona was knocked out yesterday, which busted a bunch of people's brackets. So a bunch of people are not going to care about the tournament now anyway, so whatever. But you got that going on. And uh, otherwise, in March, we've got spring potentially around the corner. Here in Erie, we are about... We're not about, but we're close to beating the record for snowfall in a season in a city. And we are currently in second place behind Buffalo. We recently just passed Syracuse, and I believe we're seven inches uh, behind Buffalo. So we need seven inches of snowfall, which some people at this point, they're just like, you know what, screw it, let's get the rest of the snow and break the record. And then you have the other people who have been sitting in a corner in their house whimpering quietly because they're so sad about all of the snow and there are people who are that way so that's that's where you got that so um yeah things are going good as far as i can as far as i can tell um you guys in general hopefully life is going good for you if you are in a cold state hopefully you're looking forward to spring and that's going to be right around the corner and if you're in a hot state you're looking forward to sweaty hot nasty summer where you can't go outside and you have to sit in air conditioning all day which some people like doing as well so hey more power to you so okay let's talk about gaming a little bit uh in terms of my gaming Uh, Since the last podcast, I have completed Super Mario Odyssey 100%. And when I say 100%, I got all of the power moons in the game that are unique. And then I bought all of the power moons to get me to 999 power moons. So I have 100% completed Super Mario Odyssey. The game was awesome. If you haven't played it, you should go out and play it. 
And um, so I can put that on the shelf and move on to other games now, which is great. So I am also playing an older game called Murdered Soul Suspect. I got it for free on Xbox when they had it with uh, their games with gold promotion. So far, I have played maybe an hour and a half of the game, and it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't really know if it's that great, but I will play through it, and I'll finish it uh, to give it a fair shake. Um, So I've been working on that, and I recently started playing The Walking Dead Season 2, the Telltale game. Again, I got that for free on uh, Xbox Games with Gold, and that game's pretty good. Um, They're not really games in the true sense of the word because there's not a whole lot of skill involved. You're basically just making decisions about dialogue and different things to say, but the story is good. And there have been already a couple shocking moments very early on in the story. So uh, that's been pretty good. And uh, along with that, I am playing Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now, Zelda Breath of the Wild, you know, won a bunch of awards, got a bunch of perfect tens. But it is a very long, drawn-out game. So I don't know how far I will get into it you know, in the near future, I play it here or there when I'm able, but the last time that I got a decent amount of uh, time to sit down and play it, it took me 45 minutes to just get from one village to the next village, just to get there, like, and I didn't even do any of the shrines, and I didn't, I mean, I explored a little bit, but I didn't, like, really play anything that was of challenge, it was just me traversing the map to get to the next village and it took me like 45 minutes so it's kind of a a big game so what i've played of it so far i really do enjoy so i'm not complaining about it but i'm just saying for me based on you know my life and you know work and things with the family going on it's gonna be hard for me to finish that game anytime soon so that's where i'm at in terms of gaming now let's talk a little bit about fish tank so i have a huge update on this podcast regarding the fish tank tower for one and also i have a small update about my bio cube so i'll start with the bio cube everything is fine with it but recently i started looking into other lighting options now you guys if you follow me on my channel you know that i i upgraded to the led bio cube hood recently maybe about four or five months ago and since upgrading to that hood I have noticed that there has not been a whole lot of growth with my coral. Um, I've also noticed that my toadstool leather... um, Toadstool, is that the right word? Yeah, my toadstool leather coral is almost shrinking, like it's not getting enough light. So I started looking into other options. I I looked at... I look at... Man, guys, I haven't been doing the podcast lately, and now all of a sudden I just don't know how to talk anymore, so I apologize. But um, I was looking at the current USA Marine Orbit LED lighting system. You guys also may have seen that I did an unboxing uh, for that lighting because I'm going to be using that on the fish tank tower. But I looked at the standard, the standard model or product or item, whatever you want to call it. And then I looked at the pro model. Now the pro model is supposed to penetrate deeper into the water, provides you know better par. Um, better par ratings for the light at certain depths so i decided to go with the pro model for the bio cube the only issue was that the angle of the lighting of the pro model is not great and even if i had it right in the middle of my tank there would be sections that would be dark and i wasn't very happy with that so i ended up returning that i'm possibly thinking of doing two of the standard uh current usa orbit oh man i'm you know what i'm talking about i'm thinking about doing two of the non-pro versions instead of the pro versions because the pro versions are a lot more and two of the non-pro versions would would provide enough light for the tank but right now i just decided to leave as is but i do have some nuisance hair algae cropping up with the led hood and i know that it's more than likely because of the lights because i have been doing a pretty good job of keeping up with water changes and keeping the tank clean so if you have a bio cube maybe you've had a similar experience maybe your experience has been good but if you currently have the power compacts um, in the original hood and you're thinking about upgrading to the led lighting that's just something to keep in mind that it's not all sunshine and roses on the other side of the rainbow there with the uh, leds so um 
Now, the big update is the fish tank tower. You probably saw a video I posted. If not, go ahead and check out my YouTube channel. I posted a video called Fish Tank Tower Disaster. Now, it's a little clickbaity, right? It's not like super disaster. But to me, it's kind of a disaster. Because it's not like a tank broke. It's not like the shelving broke. It's not like water flew everywhere. Um, you know, everything's ruined. Everything's damaged. But what I have found out is my setup in terms of my plumbing is not exactly working out the way I expected it to. And if I can explain a little bit more, I will say this. The plumbing will work the way that I did it. However, it is a very simple way of doing the plumbing. And if you do the simple way of doing the plumbing, there are a few trade-offs. The one trade-off is noise. Simple simple plumbing is louder, right? The other trade-off is in order to quiet some of that noise, uh, you know, you can do what's called a Durso standpipe. But what that does is it allows air to enter into your drain pipe. So you don't get a gurgling, sucking noise that you get when a siphon is formed, when water is draining out of the tank. But in either, either case scenario, if I were to not do the Durso or I were to do the Durso, I'm going to have bubbles in my drain line pretty much no matter what. You know, with uh, the Durso method, the bubbles will be fewer. Um, without it, there'll be, you know, there'll be a lot of bubbles because the siphon will be sucking in air um, in addition to the water. There'll be more bubbles there. And with each tank draining into the next, I would have bubbles being pushed into each of the display tanks which ultimately led me to the decision that I'm going to change the plumbing. Now, I talked about this a little bit in the video, so I don't want to really reiterate the entire thing, but essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed each of the, each of the tanks separately, and then I will have the three tanks drain down to the sump rather than you know, have them drain into each other. So I actually got the valves in the mail today, which have now introduced a new problem, a new wrench into the whole plan because the valves are kind of long and it would require me to either A, move the fish tank tower away from the wall about four to five inches, which would then result in my light that I was going to use for the topmost tank not being positioned correctly. So that's the one issue. Or I could leave the tanks alone. I could, posi I could position the valves in between the tanks in, turn in terms of on the return line. So instead of hooking the valve directly into the tank and controlling the flow into each tank individually, I would have two valves between the three tanks and use that to control the flow into the, into the three tanks. If I were to do that, that would work. I wouldn't have to move the rack, but then I would not be able to shut off the tanks individually. I could shut off the top tank individually, or I could shut off the top and middle tanks both. But if for any reason I wanted to shut off the bottom tank, I couldn't do it. If I wanted to shut off just the middle tank, I couldn't do it. So there's that factor that comes into play. Now, if I really go back and I think about it, I wasn't going to have the ability to do that anyway with the original setup, so maybe I shouldn't be so worried about it. But now that I'm going down the route of making the plumbing a little bit more complex, now I'm starting to think, well, if I'm going to go through the work of redoing the plumbing, I should have it, you know, pretty good. Well, I don't know. So those are a couple of things that I'm working out with the fish tank tower. So just so you guys know, I posted that video on my YouTube channel to show you that not everything is always going to work out perfectly. There are a lot of folks on YouTube who have fish tanks and they show you everything good about them. I'm guilty of it. Often when I show you my BioCube, I show it to you in the best possible light. I make sure it's cleaned. I do a water change before I take a video of it. Um, you know, there have been times when I've showed you that, oh, I haven't been doing a very good job with maintenance, but you know, there are folks who will do projects on YouTube and they kind of make it seem like everything goes smooth, smoothly and everything was perfect. And I guarantee you there are some things about their setup 
that they've had to change or they've had to make adjustments for or whatever. So I, that's why I posted that video because I wanted to, want you guys to see the reality of the situation, and I didn't want to make it look like you know everything was awesome when it wasn't. So, okay, so there's my fish tank update for the week here on the podcast. And now I'm going to move into the five movies in five minutes section of the podcast where I review five movies in, that's right, less than five minutes. So um, the first movie is Borg McEnroe. It is a tennis movie about the rivalry between Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe. Um, I thought it was awesome. My wife thought it was awesome. Uh, I'm a tennis fan. She's not really a tennis fan, and we both enjoyed it. So I would just say overall is a very good movie, and more than likely most people will enjoy it. It was a really good story. Um, don't look up the result. Don't look up the result of the movie because it's a true story. So don't look up the result you know, before you watch the movie, and you're, you're kind of going to be on edge. Like, how is this going to play out? Who's, who's going to win? Who's going to come out on top? Um, it was a very good movie. I gave it an A. Um, an, another movie that I recently watched is called Rocket Man. It is a, a fairly old movie. I would say it's 10 to 15 years old. It's a PG comedy. And I actually whipped out this movie because I thought the kids would really like it, and they did. And I really liked it, and my wife really liked it. It's really kind of silly. It's a lot of like slapstick physical humor. Um, the main character reminds me of Jim Carrey, but he's less obnoxious than Jim Carrey, I guess you could say. A lot of people love Jim Carrey. I like him a lot, but I feel like sometimes he can just be like more obnoxious than funny. And the main character reminds me of him, but without a lot of the obnoxiousness. Like he's got like some heart to him, and and you kind of identify him with him at times, and um, things like that. So that was a really awesome movie. It's probably one of the best comedies. It's certainly one of the best clean comedies, but one of the best comedies that I think that I've ever seen. So I gave that an A. Um, Another movie that I watched is Shape of uh, The Shape of Water. It uh, was nominated for a bunch of awards. When I watched the trailer, it had a really uh, heavy Bioshock feel to it, like it was this old, like you know older style, old music, um, Art Deco type you know um, environment world. There was a lot that had to do with water, obviously, with the tide of Bioshock. Um, uh, essentially the movie is about a woman who is a mute so she can hear but she cannot speak and she is a cleaning lady at a research facility and this research facility takes on some sort of aquatic creature which she forms a bond with um, I thought the movie was okay it wasn't as good as I expected it to be um, it was just alright I gave it a B- minus. okay moving on uh, next movie uh, Jumanji we saw Jumanji in the theaters. The kids were clamoring to see Jumanji. Jumanji is actually a continuation of the first Jumanji movie where uh, it starred Robin Williams and four people basically got sucked into this board game. Or no, they didn't get sucked into it. Uh, Robin Williams got sucked into it when he was a kid. And a few other people, a few other kids find it years later. They start playing the game. Robin Williams gets popped out of the board game and attempts to finish it. And all this crazy stuff happens with animals and hunters and, and a bunch of different things. So in this movie, the, the board game is found at the end of the first movie by somebody. The board game... It's supposed to be like this like this powerful entity almost. So like the kid who finds it looks at it, goes, ah, oh, it's a board game, this is boring. He puts it on uh, the shelf and he and he goes back to playing video games. Well, in the middle of the night, the board game like starts to shake and this green light lights up and the kid opens it and then there's a video game cartridge inside called Jumanji. And uh, long story short, a few years um, after the beginning scene, um, a bunch of kids get sucked into the game and they get sucked into the game as the character they chose in the video game. So as you may know, it stars The Rock, Kevin Hart, Jack Black, um, Karen Gilliam, uh, Nick Jonas is in it. And surprisingly, I thought it was a really good movie. It was really funny. Um, uh, some of the special effects and some of the scenes were a little bit too much in terms of being unbelievable. Like you got to suspend your belief, your disbelief because they're getting sucked into a video game. But um, 
some of the scenes were a little bit too far, so uh, that's why I didn't give it the highest mark, but I do give it an A-. minus. I thought it was a really good movie, and it'll be a good movie uh, for the whole family as long as your kids are probably 10, 11, right around that age. Now, the last movie, I'm actually taking longer than five minutes, oh man. Uh, the last movie is Molly's Game. This is another movie based on uh, true events. It is about Molly Bloom, who was an uh, U.S. Olympian. She was a downhill skier. Uh, her skiing career got cut short, of which you know they explain why at the beginning of the movie. And she went from one thing to another before ending up running these high stakes poker games for celebrities and um you know political officials government officials and things like that and it was all about how she ran these games and how she got in trouble and it's based on the true story and it was super interesting it was super well done my wife and i both really enjoyed it um, it's definitely a serious movie, but it was a lot of fun, and you never really quite knew what was going to happen. Again, don't read about it uh, before you watch the movie. Um, you'll enjoy it a lot more. I gave that an A. So we got five actually really good movies other than The Shape of Water, Shape of Water B-, minus, but the other four movies were really good, so they all come highly recommended from me. So, all right. Now, let's move on to the fish tank topic of the week which is cleaning aquarium glass. Now, I chose this topic because there were uh, a few comments on, co- on some of my videos about cleaning aquarium glass. And also, one of my coworkers who works with fish tanks occasionally asked me what the best way to clean aquarium glass was. So I figured it would be a good question to address on the Fish Tank Guy podcast, so that's why I'm addressing it. I don't know why I needed to explain that. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm going to do my usual spiel, which is I'm going to go through a couple quote-unquote websites where they have articles about cleaning aquarium glass, and then I'm going to go to the message boards there and see what a few of the regular folks in the aquarium hobby have to say. Then I'll give you my summary of it all, and then we'll move on to the fish of the week, then we'll get out of here. It's not going to be in a half an hour. I don't even bother trying to hit that time limit anymore. So, okay. Now, the first uh, source here I have is a website called Home Aquaria. The article is called Three Simple Ways to Clean Aquarium Glass. It was published on September 6, 2013. So unless there have been uh, revolutionary changes in aquarium glass cleaning technology, I would assume that this article is still relevant. So this article actually focuses on cleaning the inside and the outside of the glass. Um, they mainly talk about the inside of the glass, um, but they also do mention a few things about the outside of the glass. Let's see. Um, this is what they say about cleaning the outside of the aquarium glass. Using warm water to wet a soft cloth or paper towels. Um, they said newspaper works wonderful to clean the glass. You should not use spray cleaner such as Windex anywhere near the tank as the airborne spray can get in the water, which is very true. Uh, For hard water crystals, soak with a cloth using warm water to dissolve. And then they also say when cleaning acrylic, use a cleaner specifically for it as anything ammonia-based will ruin it. Okay, now let's talk about what they offer up here to clean the inside of your glass. I'm mainly going to focus on the outside of the glass, but we'll talk about the inside of the glass a little bit too. They say there are three ways to keep it clean. The first is the simple sponge method. They say purchase a foam kitchen sponge. Make sure that it doesn't have any added cleaner or soaps. Um, Remove your tank cover. Reach in with your hands. Slide the sponge up and down to clean away any algae. Um, Avoid overfilling the tank or rapid arm movements or water will spill over the top. They're getting a little bit obvious here. Um, Do not wash sponge out with soap and reuse. Um, So definitely don't use soap. That one is pretty obvious. No rapid arm movements or water will spill over the top. Don't stick your face in the tank or else your hair might get wet. Um, Okay. 
So uh, the next method that they talk about is the magnet method, which is simply by using a magnet cleaner. Um, the mag float cleaner, which is what I use, uh, are a very effective choice is what they say. Uh, remove the tank cover, place the half of the magnet with the cleaning pad on the inside of the glass, with the cleaning pad facing the glass. This is, I'm not reading the rest of this because it's for morons. So you guys know how, to, how a magnet cleaner works. That's their second method. And their third method is using an algae scraper. Um, they basically... <laughs> okay. They basically say the same exact thing as they do with the other two methods, except step one is purchase an algae scraper tool. They also have a point in here. Avoid rapid motions as water will slosh out over the top. (laughs) Okay, so there's Home Aquaria's methods for cleaning aquarium glass. Thank you very much, Home Aquaria, for talking to us like we're five. All right, let's go to the next one. This one is from a website that's called PetsOnMom.me. This is odd. How to remove white buildup in an aquarium by Judith Wilson. My name's Judith Wilson. Okay. Um, guys, I just feel like you're making fun of Judith because of her name and because of the fact that she's a woman. Not true. Not true. I'm just going through and making light of this to make it more interesting. Because I don't know if you guys have listened to any other Fish Tank podcasts, but I have, and they're pretty hard to get through. And I'm sure mine is hard to get through at times, too. But when somebody's just sitting there, like, hammering on, like, chemical balance and freaking pH and, like, salinity levels and the right type of food to feed your fish and they're talking about it for like 30 minutes it's just it's brutal right so i just try to throw in some dumb stuff every now and then all right so this article it seems like it seems like judith there is gonna talk talk about some interesting things because she has hers built into four different categories the first being white deposits removal of salt removal of calcium um I thought calcium is white deposits. And she has a fourth one called prevention, which is cool. All right, so let's – oh, wait a minute. Down here – oh, we have about the author. So let's give – let's give uh, – Let's give Judith some props. She has been writing since 2009, specializing in environmental and scientific topics. She has written content for school websites and worked for a Glasgow newspaper. She has a Master of Arts in English from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. See, Scottish, eh? I don't, I'm not good with, uh, I think that was a Scottish accent and an Australian accent together. Okay, so let's talk about white deposits. The white deposits on the rim occur as water evaporates. Okay, leaving calcium or salt. So these are the same, leaving calcium or salt minerals. Um, in a freshwater tank, calcium remains. In a saltwater tank, it could be either calcium or salt. Um, any deposits below the water line are calcium. Salt deposits come away with wetting and a little scrubbing. You'll probably need to dismantle the tank for the removal of calcium. Often called lime, this is the same stuff that builds up in a kettle in areas with hard water. Okay, removal of salt. Remove some of the salt as you normally do for routine water changes and tackle the salt while the water level is well below the deposits. Dampen a paper towel or sponge with dechlorinated water. Blot the salt and leave it for a few minutes. Scrub and sponge it away, taking care that most of it doesn't fall back into the tank. A little shouldn't change this. (sighs) This is silly. Um, I think I talked about this maybe last podcast where it says like oh when i talked about salt creep i talked about salt creep yeah so the i don't know the whole idea about this i get the waters evaporating but if you're topping off the tank right the salt that remains from the water that evaporated it goes without saying if you're topping off the tank and you put that salt back in the tank your salt level is going to be the same just let's make that clear right off the bat All right, next one. Removal of calcium. Dismantle the tank completely, transferring any remaining aquatic pets to another fully cycled aquarium in the same manner as which you would when bringing new ones home. Sponge the calcium deposits with white vinegar 
and let it sit for an hour, white vinegar. Scrub and repeat as necessary. In case of stubborn deposits, carefully scrape them off with a razor blade. Rinse the tank thoroughly before putting it back together and beginning the cycling process all over again. This is a good time to sterilize rocks and gravel by boiling them. Okay. And the last paragraph, which I feel is going to be the most interesting, is prevention. Okay. Both salt and calcium deposits occur as water evaporates, but prevention is not complicated. First of all, confirm you're conducting sufficient partial water changes through the use of nitrite, nitrate, and ammonia test kits. Nitrite and ammonia levels should be indiscernible, while nitrate should be extremely low except in cert certain specialized tanks. If they are fine, continue with your normal routine. But mark the water level on the outside of the glass with a permanent marker or a sticker. Top up the tank with distilled water as required. Never use any other water to replace that loss through evaporation as that would lead to the buildup of minerals in the tank water, possibly to lethal levels. So I think all of that nonsense could have been summarized by saying top off the water in your tank regularly. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. So... Judith, um, hmm, I give your article a, a B. Not bad, not great. All right, next article. The spruce. Remove and prevent white residue on aquarium glass. This was updated on November 17th of 2017, 11 17, 17 by Shirley, Shirley Sharp. Shirley Sharp. <laughs> Shirley Sharp. <laughs> That pencil is surely sharp. No, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm surely. Uh, I'm surely. I'm surely sorry. Don't call me Shirley. I don't. I'm mixing up my references now. All right. Let's see. I'm gonna skip the first paragraph. Next paragraph says products to remove safely remove lime buildup from glass. Lime buildup looks so terrible that there can be great temptation to use home cleaning products to remove it. However, resist that urge as even the smallest residue can be lethal to fish. That's true. This goes for the outside of the tank as well. There are products such as Aquarium Safe Cleaner that are made to remove lime buildup on aquarium glass. If you're looking for a greener or more inexpensive alternative, try plain white vinegar. Not only is vinegar a natural disinfectant, it also dissolves those stubborn lime deposits. For this method of cleaning, you will need to relocate your fish to a holding tank. Once your fish have been safely removed, drain the tank completely, remove any plants, lay the tank down on a towel, pour enough vinegar on the affected glass to cover it, leave it sit for 10 to 20 minutes, then scrub with a non-abrasive pad or cloth. If you have a really stubborn patch of buildup, try using a razor blade or an algae scraper. But be sure not to uh, use the algae scraper too hard because, or too hard too fast because water might splash out of it and get on your pants. Um, oh, but you already took all the water out, so you're good. Um, do not use a razor or a plexiglass on other types of acrylic tanks, blah, blah, blah. Make sure you rinse it well, and uh, you can also sterilize your rocks. Okay, let's see. Ooh! Shirley has a preventing lime buildups in aquarium paragraph as well. Let's see if this nonsense makes any more sense. The easiest way to avoid spending time scrubbing the tank with vinegar is to prevent it from getting that way in the first place. Very true. As the evaporation process is what causes the residue, keep an eye on your tank's water line as the water starts to evaporate. Replace it with still. Oh, come on. Come on, Shirley. Come on. There is another paragraph that could have been replaced with top off the water in your aquarium often that is what that could have been replaced with all right Shirley I give you uh I give you uh, an a minus on your article good job okay let's go to the message boards let's see what a few of these folks have to say and um let's go from there all right this is a thread called help Bought a used tank and can't get it clean. This person is named Utaku. Is there <laughs> is there name Utaku? Okay. Hello everyone. I bought a sixty gallon shallow aquarium. I'd love to get going. I uh, just wanted to let y'all bleed. Okay. Try to use vinegar. Left it soaked. And a paper towel overnight, plastic wrap over it, scrubbed and nothing. Used water and a razor for a few hours. Then I went to Barkeeper's Friend. 
I've done this numerous times. It helped a little to a point, and then nothing. I'm running out of options. The next person, Sully, said, what are you trying to clean? Water sp- spots, water spats, water spots, or old tank residue? Um, the next person, Coral Bandit, said, I would use enough vinegar to form a quarter-inch layer, saturating and letting it sit for a day or so, I think. Most everything will be removable. You may still need a razor, but vinegar, spelled incorrectly, melts my coralline algae of my high doors like it was never there. Just rotate the tank from bottom to side to side, letting all surfaces soak for as long as necessary. All right. Reefing Madness posted a picture that says third-party hosting has been temporarily disabled. Okay, so the picture's gone. Um, the next person said is their name is Gobi. I've used steel wool to clean old glass tanks with tough buildup. I've buffed them by hand. I've seen my dad do it with some kind of drill bit that I think he made his, himself. Yeesh. If you have three tanks, you may want to consider the bit idea. It's a lot of work. But when you're done, you will literally have flawless glass. You can't use steel wool on acrylic, though. It will scratch. Uh, <laughs> Reefing madness here. Yeah, there's an idea. Go get a drill bit in all caps and use it to clean your tank. LMFAO. Um, Coral Bandit, I'd be reluctant to use steel wool also. Maybe just me, but scratch glass sends to places no one wants to be with me. Sends me to places, you meant to say. Reefing Madness posted another photo that's gone. Silver Garami said, uh, let's see. Are the stains raised or embedded? If they are embedded, spelled wrong, underneath the surface, then I would say you have etched glass marking. Not sure if there is a fix for such, but hopefully it's only on one side. So you can turn the etched side to the back and maybe use tint or scene to mask it. Hmm, interesting. Um, let's see. Gobi. Gobi's back. I've been using fine steel wool to clean polished glass aquariums for 30 plus years. It doesn't scratch the glass. It actually buffers any scratches out. I've always done it by hand, but my dad had a rotary tool of some sort that had a cushioned, round, fine steel wool polishing pad. Nice. And Reefing Madness applied with an emoji that is a guy face palming himself. Um, ooh, Taku wrote back and said, thanks for the response. I just let the vinegar soak for a little over 24 hours with no luck. I'm hesitant on the steel wool idea. I'll give the steel wool idea. He says a couple things more, and then he says I'll give the steel wool idea a shot. Uh, the next person... Tie. I bought my tank used and had some kind of residue around the top of the glass. I scrubbed and scrubbed, kind of a clean freak, and never got it clean. I eventually gave up and just filled it with water. When there's water and covering it, you can't tell the residue is there. Although, I do keep my water line just above the black trim piece um, so you don't see any of it at all. Believe me, I was not happy about it, but it did make me feel a lot better that you can't see it now that the tank is set up and full. All right, so that is the end of that thread. We've got one more thread here. It is on Simply Discuss. Discuss? Discuss? I don't know. The title of the topic is, What is the best way to clean calcium buildup from aquarium glass cover? Russ asked, Hey, my uh, glass aquarium cover has white film over it. I guess it's a calcium buildup that I can't seem to remove. Someone suggested using white vinegar, which I tried, but it didn't work too well. Does anyone have any suggestions? Thank you, Russ. Um, Eddie wrote, uh, generally white vinegar does the trick. Did you spray it on and let it soak for a few minutes and then scrub it with green scrub pad? May want to try a razor blade. Um, this person, this girl, this girl, uh, said, I've used CLR, green bottle and household cleaning departments of grocery stores or Lowe's. Grocery stores or Lowe's, nowhere else. It is calcium lime rust remover, just rinse very well. That's true, because it could be bad. Um, next person, Frenchy 100, I usually use white vinegar. Um, now I use aquarium cleaning wipes, but I think those are vinegar based, so... <sighs> I think those are vinegar based so who knows Um, Bilbo said both CLR and vinegar or other mildly acidic solution even lemon juice should work 
Both are quite weak, so it shouldn't damage the surface of your glass. It's far better to use one of these products and wait, it is it's far better to use one of these products and spend more time. Oh, than a stronger acid to speed up the process because you may end up damaging the tank or yourself. Um, if no fish in the tank, if no fish in tank, elbow oh razor blade and some elbow grease. Oh, there's another person who's super worried about water spilling out, I guess. Um, a few other people said vinegar. Um, no matter what you do, make sure you let it soak. Some people, ooh, some people are saying diluted muriatic acid and bring up the concentrate. I wouldn't do that. Um, then they say I would you try using vinegar again and letting it soak. And Russ never responded to the thread, so I can't use my country voice. For Russ anymore. What's the best way to clean a calcium buildup from the aquarium glass aquarium cover? Ha! My, okay. So there you go. So we've got our uh, website sources and we've got our message boards. And now to summarize, I would say, guys and gals, if you want to clean white buildup on your tank, I would try vinegar. It's probably going to be your best bet. You're going to want to let it soak. You can use some sort of scrubber. Um, I wouldn't jump to steel wool right away. And if you're cleaning the inside of your tank, you can use a sponge with no soap. You can use a magnet cleaner. You can use an algae scraper. And what you want to do is you want to, you know, scrape, scrub, or magnetize as feverishly as possible when you're cleaning on the inside of the tank, especially if it's full of water. So if it's full of water, make sure you you shove your entire arm into the fish tank and go back and forth as fast as you can because that will clean everything perfectly. Um, it'll be awesome. It'll be a great way to clean your tank. Um, so there you have it. Basically, the summary is uh, white vinegar is a good solution for some of that tricky aquarium buildup that you might have on your tank. So hopefully if you guys weren't aware of that before, now you know a little bit more. I know that wasn't my best topic in hindsight, looking back on the last 15 minutes, wasn't my best topic, but hopefully you guys got something out of it. All right, so let's do the fish of the week and then let's get the heck out of here. All right, so I'm over at Live Aquarium, my favorite website of all time. Not really, I've never even bought anything from there. And this week's fish of the week is the copper band butterfly fish. This fish is awesome looking. It is white with orange yellowish colorations with black markings on it as well. It's very cool. You guys should check it out if you haven't seen it. Let's go over some quick stats. Minimum tank size 125 gallons. That seems a little bit extreme, but hey, it is what it is. Care level difficult. This is the first difficult fish that I have uh, talked about. Its temperament is peaceful, reef compatible with caution. Its diet is a carnivore. Its color form is orange, white, and yellow, and its max size is eight inches. All right, let's read the overview here. The copper band butterfly, also known as the beaked butterfly fish, beaked coral fish, or orange striped butterfly, has a long, narrow nose and mouth used for hunting into crevices and holes for food. The copper band butterfly butterfly fish has yellow-orange vertical bands with black edging. It has a false eye spot on the rear of the dorsal fin. This is a difficult fish to mistake for any other because it's freaking cool, man. It is best housed in very large reefs or in peaceful community tanks. It should be kept singly, not with conspecifics or similar butterfly fish, and should not be kept with any stress-inducing fish. That's why I'm speaking in a calm manner. Caution should be exercised if housing these fish in a reef aquarium. They may pick on invertebrates, especially anemones and feather dusters. They are an excellent fish when used to control aptasia or glass anemones in a reef aquarium. The copper band butterfly fish is a difficult fish to feed. It is as it is shy. It is a shy, excuse me, and deliberate feeder that may need a variety of foods offered to it in order to start feeding. So there you have it. Thank you for reading about the copper band butterfly fish. Also, you should feel relaxed and at ease. Go to your happy place. Okay, 
Let's talk about customer testimonials. Got my boy Aaron M. from Oak Harbor, Ohio, which is actually where one of my best friends is from. No way. Oak Harbor, Ohio. This guy says the species is easy to keep if you have certain organisms present in your system. First, they love feather dusters. Purchase some live rock and build it in a way that small feather dusters always have a place to grow, safely grow and breed. Um... Okay, Eddie G. from Mount Dora, Florida says these fish are excellent Aptasia eaters. Unfortunately, they are also quite finicky. Be sure you've got plenty of food alternatives once the Aptasia are gone. Um, Let's go to... How about Tracy K.? It is true that they are very difficult to get eating prepared food, but once they do, they eat almost anything. Gets along well with all the fish in my tank, but beware, they will pick at and eat clams and any meaty LPS coral such as brain or donut corals. Ooh, that might be that might be dangerous. So there you go. There is the fish of the week. It is the copper band butterfly fish. You guys want to make sure you don't stress that out. So if you choose to buy one, I suggest you talk like this to the fish to make sure it stays calm and it, it feels like it has a safe place to be. It, it, it can live in a safe space. All right. So um, once again, I'm the fish tank guy. Thank you so much for checking out the fish tank po- uh, geez, the fish tank guy podcast this week. Um, I know I ran long. I always run long. So if you ever expect me to not run long, you're listening to the wrong uh, podcast. And I will be back in about two weeks to talk about a whole bunch of more fish stuff. I've got already a few good topics lined up. I will have more updates on the fish tank tower at that time. Hopefully I have some good things to tell you guys about it. Um, hopefully I have some more videos posted on YouTube and you guys can follow along with me. So, uh, if you are listening to this or while you're not going to be watching anything, it's just a static image. If you are listening to this on YouTube, you know, give me a thumbs up, maybe shoot me a comment, maybe subscribe if you would, I'd really appreciate it. And if you're listening to this on podcast services, just keep on doing your thing and, uh, checking out the fish tank guy, uh, podcast. I really appreciate it. So, all right, guys, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Hopefully everything goes well for you. You have a good couple weeks here going into spring and, um, I'll talk to you soon.